Um, I would like to Im introduce our next speaker, Dr. Chris Bolas. Dr. Bolas specializes in liver diseases, specifically autoimmune liver diseases and chronic hepatitis B. His research interests are aimed at explaining the immunological basis of and developing new therapies for PBC and PSC. He also collaborates with other investigators and community organizations to overcome barriers to health disparities in hepatitis B and liver cancer among Asian Americans. As the program director, he has overseen the education of training of fellows in the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at UC Davis Medical Center. Dr. Bullis serves on multiple, multiple regional and national committees related to liver diseases and postgraduate education. Dr. Bolas is a board-certified gastroenterologist and is a fellowship program director as well as division chief of gastroenterology and hepatology at UC Davis Medical Center. As a matter of fact, most of you probably don't know, he uh, caught a flight early this morning and will be leaving as soon as he's done. So we're going to, we appreciate the fact that he took time out of his busy schedule to come and talk to us. He has been invited to speak for dozens of programs to extend the knowledge of hepatitis B, PSC, and PBC. In 1996, Dr. Polis also had been an instrumental in several grant-funded studies on liver disease and is currently the principal investigator on studies on treatment for PSC and PBC. He has also worked in collaboration with Dr. Gershwin on various studies. In 1991, Dr. Bolas was honored as Liver Scholar by the American Liver Foundation and in 19, I'm sorry, and in 2013 won the prestigious Walter Trudeau Excellence in Teaching Award. He has published or co-published over 80 individual articles and abstracts as well as contributing to chapters of books and other publications. Currently, he is on the Gastroenterology Fellowship Selection Committee. He is a member of the AASLD Annual Meeting Education Committee, as well as the Associate Edi Editor of BMC Gastroenterology. Finally, Dr. Bullis has been an invaluable asset to PBCR's community as a guest speaker at our conferences in his research and practice. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bullis. much. Um, well, th thank you for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity. Um, it was really important, I think, for me to come here. And I've been to some of your other uh, events in, in Las Vegas. Um, and it's always been a, a great opportunity to come and speak with you all. And uh, uh, I think I see some familiar faces here as well. What I was asked to speak on was to discuss the similarities, differences, between uh, primary biliary cholangitis and primary sclerosing cholangitis. Uh, and for lots of reasons, these are entities that can easily get confused. Um, and I'm sure um, you've all heard of uh, both these, these uh, conditions. And with the name change, it's the, the risk is that there'll be more confusion. So what I want to do is go over the um, the two conditions and talk a little bit about the similarities, but also talk about the differences, because while they share some similarities, there are really some major differences between them. Now, for the most part, these two conditions fall within a group of autoimmune liver diseases. Um, and usually when you talk to people that treat PBC and PSC, they also have an interest in autoimmune hepatitis. These are all sort of the autoimmune liver diseases, and they're all each very distinct. One important factor is they're all rare diseases, but despite being rare, uh, they together make up a significant uh, percentage of the liver transplants and liver morbidity mortality that occurs in this country. And what this shows here is just the number of liver transplants for each of these entities. And so in the blue here, this is PBC, and the red is PSC, and the, the gray here, autoimmune hepatitis. And you can see as liver transplant became more popular, the numbers of transplants for each of those indications increased. And then in the mid-1990s, this was when Urso started being used. And look what happened to PBC. It dropped down very nicely, and it's maintained there for, for quite a while. It hasn't gone all the way down. It hasn't continued that traje trajectory downward, 
uh, but it had a nice drop here, and, and hopefully with new therapies, we'll see this drop further. Um, PSC, on the other hand, uh, came up and maintained uh, its rate of transplantation. It's really not seen any difference, and probably related because there's no uh, therapy that's been shown to be effective for it yet. And same autoimmune hepatitis, we actually do have effective therapies for the most part. Most patients do respond, but still uh, contributes to uh, some transplants being done. So what's really important in terms of understanding the differences of these entities is what part of the liver is affected by them. And this is a very simplistic look at um, what they affect. And so autoimmune hepatitis, that affects the major liver cells in the organ, the hepatocytes. Uh, PSC affects the larger bile ducts, and PBC, the small bile ducts. And so that, that's essentially the difference of these diseases, the major differences between all three. And as you can see, PBC and PSC affect bile ducts. And uh, if you look at a normal liver under a microscope, uh, this is what it would look like. You'd have most of the cells being made of these hepatocytes, or the main liver cells. And these are sort of the cells that are attacked by viral hepatitis, alcohol, and in the case of autoimmune hepatitis, that's what the immune response is directed against. Within this area here, this is called our portal tract, there are three major structures. One is a vein here, there's a little artery there, and then here is a bile duct. And this is the target of injury, both in PSC and PBC. Regardless of what the injury is, uh, whether it's PSC, PBC, autoimmune hepatitis, or viral hepatitis, the natural history of these diseases is, is progression from that inflammation, whether it's to the hepatocyte or the bile duct, which leads to fibrosis or scarring in the liver. In some individuals, that scarring will advance far enough to develop cirrhosis, and then from there, and I know you've had some discussions already on liver transplantation, this might have already been discussed, discussed that can then become decompensated cirrhosis where you have complications of the cirrhosis and need liver transplantation. And rarely uh, in PBC or PSC lead to liver cancer. And then many people with chronic liver disease, regardless of the cause, have fatigue, but particularly in PBC, as we know, and pruritus, and we'll talk about that a little bit because that's one of the shared features of both PBC and PSC. So really comparing then the PBC and PSC entities, I want to go over basically four areas uh, to kind of compare and contrast them. First, what is the definition and diagnosis of, the P of PSC and, and PBC? What, why would there be confusion when you see your physician when a physician is making the diagnosis? What are the symptoms? Um, what are the causes of these diseases? Do we know what the causes are and, and where do we stand on that? And then finally, what are the treatments available? So one area that obviously leads to confusion uh, in these conditions is the name. Um, they're both primary, uh, and basically it just means that it's not a result of some other disease leading to uh, a secondary biliary, uh, what we used to call cirrhosis, or uh, secondary sclerosing cholangitis. So there are conditions which can lead to sclerosing of the bile ducts, and we call that secondary sclerosing cholangitis. Biliary, of course, just means it's related to the bile ducts. Sclerosing is stiffening of, of tissue, so this is stiffening of the bile ducts. And then they both are cholangitis, just meaning there's inflammation of the bile ducts. And one of the discussions about the renaming, which you might have discussed earlier, is primary biliary cholangitis. Biliary cholangitis is a bit redundant because the only kind of cholangitis you can have is biliary, but it kept the PBC, and that was very important. So, um, so while this is a very important name change and is, is more specific and gets us away from that cirrhosis uh, in, in accurate term for this condition, it has the potential to lead to more confusion because the names even become more similar. Um, now, most people still refer to them as PBC and, and PSC, and in fact, I've heard some physicians refer to one or the other as uh, PBS, as in primary biliary sclerosis, and that's not a disease. <laughs> so, so what they have in common is, is 
they are diseases of the bile ducts, right? Um, and they typically present with elevated alkaline phosphatase, that is, they're cholestatic liver diseases. Diseases that impair bile flow, that injure the bile ducts, these are cholestatic liver diseases. And they have a typical presentation when your doctor looks at your liver test and sees an abnormality, they shouldn't just classify it as abnormal liver test, it should follow a pattern, typically either cholestatic or hepatocellular, depending on what cells are being injured. And in PBC and PSC, they have very similar patterns, they're cholestatic. They're also similar in that they're inflammatory autoimmune conditions. There's no infectious uh, disease that's causing that that we know of. There's no toxin that's causing it. It's the body's immune system inappropriately causing inflammation that's attacking the bile ducts. And they're both rare liver diseases. So these fall into that category of diseases that most physicians aren't going to see more than one or two cases in you know, their clinical experience, at least in primary care. Your family doctor may never see these conditions, and so missing it's understandable. And even gastroenterologists are probably going to deal with this very infrequently. So no, the knowledge out there, um, if you're not in a specialized center, is going to be relatively limited. So how do we define these diseases? Well, if we just look at the patients that are affected by these diseases, um, the, I think if we look around the room, we know that 90% of people affected with PBC uh, are women. Uh, on the other hand, PSC affects primarily men, um, but not exclusively. And, and this is something that I think can work either way when people present, uh, is that men can be misdiagnosed as PSC because we all know PBC is only a disease of women, right? Um, no, it's not. On the other hand, PSC, while it's male predominant, it does occur in women, and frequently they'll get mixed diagnosed as PBC. In fact, I'll tell you about a case I saw not too long ago. Um, the age of PBC patients, the age of diagnosis tends to be a little bit uh, higher than in PSC, and PBC is very rare to occur uh, below the age of 30. There are cases that people being diagnosed in their 20s, um, but, but usually it's older than that. In PSC, we have pediatric cases, uh, children uh, in uh, their you know, early teens even. Again, both present with elevated alkaline phosphatase. Importantly, antimitochondrial antibodies are um, in PBC very common, but not seen and should not be seen in PSC. Liver biopsies is a third piece of the diagnosis of, uh, make, of PBC. And typically there's bile duct destruction and other features such as granulomas that, look, that, that are often found on our biopsies. While in PSC there's described this onion skin fibrosis, and I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. But it's very important to recognize that both of these biopsies um, are not necessarily specific to that disease. And either one can just show some bile duct injury or, or activity around the bile ducts. And so biopsy alone can be consistent with either of these diseases, but not necessarily diagnostic. Um, in contrast, a, a cholangiogram, and this is a picture of the bile ducts, and I'll show you an example in a minute again. This has to be or should be normal in PBC, whereas it's really the basis of the diagnosis for PSC. And then inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis, is incredibly common in PSC. About 80% of the patients with PSC will have inflammatory bowel disease. And while it's more frequent in PBC than it is in the general population, it's still only about 1% or so of PBC patients that also have inflammatory bowel disease. So the keys to defining the diseases in PBC, I think you probably all know this, is you have to have two of these three criteria to make the diagnosis of PBC. You have to have an elevated alkaline phosphatase that's persistent, an anti-mitochondrial antibody, and or a liver biopsy. And essentially that means that if you're AMA negative, if you're in this 10% here, then um, you need a liver biopsy to make the diagnosis, right? On the other hand, in PSC, you have to rule out any other possible cause of this abnormal alkaline phosphatase and then have an abnormal cholangiogram. There's no blood test or anything else that can make the diagnosis for us. Just a quick point on um, making the diagnosis of PBC. Uh, this may have been brought up previously. 
while if you're AMA negative and you have an elevated alkaline phosphatase, you have the diagnosis. If you have an elevated alkaline phosphatase, AMA negative, you need to have a liver biopsy. I've seen two patients in the last month that had an AMA positive but had normal alkaline phosphatases. Why it was done, I don't know. Lots of reasons. And they came to me to see if they needed to have a liver biopsy or not. Because strictly speaking, if they had a liver biopsy that showed this, they would have PBC because they have an AMA positive and some, bio, uh, some liver biopsy changes. But in my experience, I, years ago I did a few of these biopsies. The biopsies are generally benign. And so my recommendation is not to do liver biopsies if the alkaline phosphatase is persistently normal and you just have a positive anti-mitochondrial antibody. And we know that anti-mitochondrial antibodies are more prevalent um, than PBC. So we do see it in people without PBC. And they're probably just at risk of developing it later in life. So these are the liver biopsies I promised to show you. And on the left here is the PBC biopsy. Uh, uh, classic fluorid duct lesion. This is the bile duct here with all these um, little dots here that are inflammatory cells encircling it. And then over here is the classic onion skinning around a bile duct. And it's the type of fibrosis that um, just kind of goes around in rings, concentric rings around the bile duct. Now we only see this in a minority actually of biopsies we do in PSC. And we can see things that look very similar to this in PSC. So. Um, it's important to look in the context in which we see these biopsies to make a diagnosis. Now this is where things are clearly different between the two, and that's in the cholangiogram. So these are MRIs, and it can be done endoscopically also, but typically we use an MRI to um, uh, have a, a cholangiogram performed, and, and these are just pictures of the bile ducts. So let me just orient you here, and this is a normal cholangiogram here, this isn't actually a PBC patient, but this is what it should look like. Uh, this is the duodenum, the small intestine here, where the bile duct enters right here. And there's the pancreatic duct going off this way, the common bile duct coming up here, and then the gallbladder would be up here, and then coming up into the liver and going into different branches, kind of like this trunk of a tree and then various branches. And I think you can tell over here, in a PSC patient, this is much different. You have these. This is all dilated here, um, probably because there's a stricture right down here. There are strictures up here in the tree, and you see beyond that there's dilation of the bile ducts here, and another stricture here with dilation of this bile duct here. So it looks like a ragged tree instead of a nice branching tree, and this is the real difference between the two, and that's because in PBC, the bile ducts being affected, are, we can't see on a cholangiogram, they're too small. Whereas in PSC, it affects these larger bile ducts, the medium and large size bile ducts, and they get these kind of uh, strictures with dilation. So this is a case that um, was actually misdiagnosed as PBC and can, I think, illustrate what some of the potential problems can be in terms of differentiating these two diseases. So this was a, a woman in her late 20s who actually contacted us about uh, participating in a PBC clinical trial. Uh, she had been seen for, by her uh, gastroenterologist for an, a persistently elevated alkaline phosphatase. The antimitochondrial antibody was negative, so they did a liver biopsy, and they saw the typical bile duct injury. And so she was diagnosed with AMA negative PBC. She had no history of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and um, because of her age, I thought that was a little odd to be, I mean, AMA negative PBC is relatively uncommon. It's only about 10% of all PBC patients, and someone in their 20s would be uncommon as well. So we had her get a cholangiogram, and the cholangiogram actually was abnormal and showed that she had PSC. And we had her get a, a, a colonoscopy. In fact, she had colitis. So she was actually a patient with pretty typical PSC, but had been misdiagnosed as AMA negative PBC because they didn't do a cholangiogram and think that she might have that. So infrequently, infrequent, but this is what can happen if we're not careful. Other differences that can occur between PBC and PSC are the uh, associated conditions. I know this has been discussed as well already today. So in PBC, you actually have your high cholesterol, your hyperlipidemia. 
But that also happens in PSC, and it happens really in any time where you have <coughs> excuse me, um, severe cholestasis. Whenever there's obstruction of bile, um, you can get high cholesterol and hyperlipidemia. We heard just a minute ago about the osteopenia and osteoporosis, the bone disease associated with PVC. And again, that can occur in PSC as well. Again, the cholestasis, the liver disease, is one of the predisposing factors. Um, they're not as at great of risk as uh, PBC because it tends to be more a disease of younger men, but they also have inflammatory bowel disease, often have been on uh, glucocorticoids or steroids for their inflammatory bowel disease, so have lots of other risk factors. So it's something to be uh, aware of for both diseases. Thyroid disease is very common in PBC, not so much in PSC. We talked about inflammatory bowel disease. Liver cancer is very rare in both. But bile duct cancer, where there's no known risk of bile cancer in PBC, bile duct cancer in PBC, and PSC, there's a real true risk of that as well as colon cancer. So cancer in PSC is much more of a concern uh, and something we really need to be aware of. Symptoms between the two are also very similar. Uh, both diseases can be asymptomatic. Um, both present what can uh, have itch. The itch is a little different though. As I'm talking, I see someone. <laughs> Paritis, so you don't itch. Um, the itch of PBC, while it can be sort of waxing and waning in good days and, and bad, um, there's usually a sort of a, when people have it, there's usually a baseline, or at least, and you can tell me if that's not true, but that's what I've kind of been told by patients that suffer from itch with PBC. On the other hand, PSC tends to really have itch more when they have an acute obstruction because they're, they have their large ducts mainly involved. And so when one of their large ducts gets blocked, um, they get itch, but then something can be done. It can be dilated, and then the bile flows again, and the itch goes away. Um, so itch is common to both, but it has a different pattern. Uh, and uh, but treatment of it's the same uh, and trying to manage it. Fatigue is common to both. As I mentioned, it's also seen in um, uh, other forms of chronic liver disease. Whether the characteristics of the fatigue are the same, whether the mechanisms are the same as PBC, we really don't know. Not as much work has been done in PSC on fatigue as has been done like at Newcastle and David Jones's group uh, for PBC. Uh, sort of the Sika syndrome, the dry eyes, the dry mouth. We don't see that in PSC, whereas it's very common in PBC. And right upper quadrant pain, how many people have right upper quadrant pain with PBC? Right upper quadrant pain, liver pain. Yeah, some, some people, I mean, so PBC patients do describe it, um, and it's probably more common in PSC, again, because when they get an obstruction, they, it, it can be, um, like a, a more severe uh, pain, whereas I think with both conditions, you also can have this chronic dull ache um, uh, related to, to liver inflammation. Um, also in PSC, uh, when they get obstructed, they can have fevers with infection, and we typically would not expect to see that in uh, PBC. So I'm gonna go from sort of the clinical aspects and talk a little bit more about um, what we know causes PBC and PSC. And did Dr. Gershwin talk a lot about this already? I don't wanna, no, yes. <laughs> I'll explain it more in more simple terms <laughs> so that I can understand it. So what I'm gonna talk about actually is a lot of work that obviously uh, Dr. Gershwin's done uh, in understanding what causes PBC. And, the big difference between PBC and PSC is we really understand a whole lot more about what causes PBC than we do about PSC, largely because of the work of what Eric's done. So not surprisingly, this PBC results from a, a combination of both genetic risk factors and environmental exposures. Um, and so we'll, I'll show you very quickly some things on the, the genes we know are involved. There are also environmental exposures. Um, I didn't have listed here smoking. So we know PBC patients um, have an increased prevalence of smoking. So smoking is a risk factor for, for, uh, for PBC. 
but also there are risk of microorganisms and uh, xenobiotics, these uh, uh, chemicals that can modify proteins. And what this all leads to then is a breakdown in our immune system's tolerance to that anti-mitochondrial antibody, what we call antigen, the protein against which the antibodies are reacting to. And so we detect that with anti-mitochondrial antibody. But it requires one further step, and that is that we actually have to have the inflammation or the attack of the bile duct, the bile duct injury. And that's likely related to the way bile duct cells die and some other factors. On the other hand, PSC, we really don't understand. I have a nice little model here, but it's just speculation. Again, there are genes, some of which we've identified, other risk factors in the environment, many of which we don't understand, although in this condition, smoking is a protective factor. So people with PSC are less frequently smokers than um, the general population. This leads to a, a cascade of immune responses in the colon, which then lead to the inflammation in the liver, fibrosis of those bile ducts, buildup of toxic bile, and what we recognize as PSC. And this is really just to show you the connection between the colon and the liver, and this is particularly important for for um, PSC, but it may actually play a role in PBC and it would be an interesting area of investigation. Um, I'm sure you've all heard a lot about the microbiome and how bacteria in our gut and our gut flora influence our health. And it's clear that things like that are important in certain types of infections in the colon and maybe even in inflammatory bowel disease. And even in certain liver diseases, it's been investigated and, and it's shown to be an, an important factor. Um, and it could be that it's important in PBC as well because there is a direct connection from the gut to the liver. There are, the blood from the colon and intestines flows through um, the portal system into the liver directly. It doesn't go around the rest of our body first. Uh, and when we have inflammation in the liver, these inflammatory cells circulate to the liver and they can be trapped there and set up inflammation. And, and we definitely know that in PSC, the inflammatory cells in the liver causing the damage originated in the gut. So that's the reason there's this link between inflammatory bowel disease and inflammation and PSC is because these cells are getting misdirected to the liver and causing damage there. Whether something similar is occurring in PBC isn't clear um, or whether they're just simply originating elsewhere and then for other reasons homing to the liver and causing it uh, is yet to be determined. So some of the risk factors I mentioned in PBC and PSC, smoking has opposite effects. Urinary tract infections definitely have been associated with PBC, um, not so much with PSC. An interesting study from the Mayo Clinic suggests that coffee consumption um, may be protective for PSC. Uh, that should be the other way. Uh, and then toxins, this idea that living close to some, you know, uh, super fun cleanup site in New York's been associated with PBC. Some of the uh, data from the UK suggests that there may be environmental toxins um, that lead to um, PBC or increase the risk of PBC. And we have some data also suggesting that other environmental factors may do the same in PSC. In terms of genetics, um, I think that even if you're not a geneticist and you look at this picture here in PBC and this picture here in PSC, you'd say they look slightly different. And the big difference is this gene here, this one that's real tall called the HLA, it's the most important gene that's been found in PBC along with these other genes here. Whereas in PSC, this is the same gene HLA and it's just incredibly important. It's, it's, it, it overshadows every other possible important gene. So genetically, they're, they're different. Not surprising, actually. In terms of the actual mechanisms that then lead to PBC, the, the role of these exposures and what we call xenobiotics has been pretty well um, I'd say a, a established or potentially established by this work that Eric's done um, 
using these chemicals that look very similar to the normal modification of the protein in the mitochondria that the AMA is reacting against. So normally the AMA reacts to this chemical called lipoic acid, and this is on the protein. And there's another chemical that looks very similar to it. The only difference is instead of this ring here, it's opened up. And if you take anti-mitochondrial antibody, if I take blood from any of you that have, and maybe we did use some of your blood, um, if we took your blood and you have anti-mitochondrial antibody, and we looked to see if it reacted against this or this, we could find that in many PBC patients it reacted even stronger to this chemical than it did to this chemical. And this chemical is found frequently in cosmetics and other things. And you can actually take this and put it on.